This is a monumental feat for you in your career. 20 years in the game. You have this dynamic live record. You have Napa Valley, this program that you have been doing that has been getting larger and larger every year. Tell me about how you feel now musically now versus when you first started 20 years ago. Oh, man. Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know, i just been trying to grow and do different things musically or different genres kind of messing around with a lot of different things when i first started out i was mostly influenced by uh, more of the fusion side of jazz and then as i got more into it i started going more uh throwing r b in there and then i went to the funk direction for a while then i mean i 
I've kind of put all kinds of different things in there. So I, I feel now that I'm uh, have definitely versed in a lot of different genres and, and, and can kind of play in all those uh, different styles well. You know, Brian, one of the things, and I told you this a few minutes ago, I remember seeing you for the very first time about 2001 or two, okay. the VMV Smooth Jazz Festival. And one thing that I'm noticing, like, then, and I'm noticing that the fans outside, your fans are diverse, man. And that really kind of explains how your music has reached out to a lot of important music fans all over the world. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Um, depending on, you know, where we're at, we'll see young kids, uh, with the grandparents, white, black, Asian, uh, Latin. I mean, everybody's coming to the shows. It's great. I love to see that. And everyone's, you know, feeling it too. So um, I think, you know, instrumental music and jazz especially can be broad and, and reach different uh, demographics and, and, and different people and bring people together. And that means a lot to me. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, and it speaks volumes because this show tonight here at BB Kings is sold out. I mean, it's, it speaks volumes to the music, and we get ready to talk about that. I think this live album that you put out really celebrates the 20 years that you've been in the business, but I think another thing that makes you very, very different than a lot of your contemporaries is that in addition to you playing the keyboards, you play the trombone. Uh. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, I mean, I just started that in fifth grade band. You know, I just played it in band, and I, I, I just started loving it immediately. I actually liked playing trombone more than the piano in the beginning, because uh, piano, I was doing traditional classical piano lessons, and like many eight-year-olds, I hated it. <laughs> but uh, starting to play in the trombone in the band and, and going into the jazz band and this and that, that made me, uh, I don't know, I got excited about that. So. Trombone, really, you know, in the history of jazz, I mean, it's a very complicated instrument. I mean, you have to put it up there with the trumpet. Tell me how the trombone came into your psyche because you, you're coming in a great, you got Fred Wesley, who's a great, great trombonist, but you also had Jack Teagarden as well as Tommy Dorsey. Well, I also listened to Earth, Wind & Fire in Chicago, and Tower Power and all these horn bands in the 70s, late 70s, uh, when I was born. And I started listening to that at an early age. So the sound of the horn section really hit me. And I wanted to do that someday. And that's why a lot of my music has the horns in it. And I still carry a trumpet player and a sax player in my touring group. And then I break out the bone and we got that, that section going. And I just love that sound. And so that's, that's how I got into it. You know, they, they say you were kind of a music prodigy as a kid. You start, you said you started off playing piano. And then, but actually what's interesting is that trombone is what you studied when you went to college. Yeah, well, I, I was in the jazz ensemble. I was playing lead trombone and the, you know, traditional jazz stuff. But on the side, I was also studying heavy uh, music composition and arranging uh, you know, working with string orchestras and this and that, doing the arrangements. So I was getting way heavy into that on the side, and people didn't really even realize that, what I was doing. Uh, they just knew me as a trombone player because I would go out and do gigs on trombone around the city of Chicago. And then uh, as soon as I put my first record out and it was all piano bass, everyone was like, what? Who? Who's that? Why is there piano? Where's the trombone? I didn't even really put much trombone on my first record. Uh, so, you know, but I was always playing piano, just kind of on the, on the down low. How did the piano catch up with what you were doing? Because there was also a period of time when you were writing jingles, you know, when you came out of school. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it caught up to my trombone playing after maybe two or three years of actually touring my own music. In the beginning, after my first record and second and third even I was kind of nervous up on stage because I wasn't a natural performer on the piano I was more of a trombone player uh, but slowly the more and more I did it just like anything else you get more comfortable uh, people start coming to the shows because they know the music they've heard it on the radio maybe um, so in the very beginning they don't know who you are they don't know any of your music so I was real nervous in the beginning I was pretty pretty timid and shy. I even sat up over to the side and put the sax player in the middle of the band. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but now, you know, it's a totally different story. I love performing, and uh, I've just kind of grown into it, gravitated towards, um, you know, getting that audience reaction, and I really feed off of that now. same age and I remember a time in the late 70s and 80s guys like Joe Sample and Bob James they really kind of reintroduced the electronic keyboards and even Diodato Diodato did some really funky things on keyboard I'm noticing that over the years your music has really been the blend of both you've had R&B but you've also done some pop and you've also done some straight ahead smooth jazz songs. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I like to mix it up. Um, from album to album, I always have kind of different concepts in mind. I don't want to make that the, the same record over and over again. To me, that's just like, okay, I've done that. What's next? Where am I going to go? And um, thankfully, you know, my fans have kind of gone along that. I guess musical journey that I've been on and and embraced kind of wherever I'm going. Um, I'm already starting a, another funk record this year that'll come out about a year and a half from now. Uh, a lot of work to do on that, but uh, it's been over seven years since I did the last funk record. I've gone in some other directions now. I'm ready to come back and kind of uh, do something new in that arena. So I got some ideas brewing already. So Brian, you've produced a hodgepodge of great r&b vocalist on your projects and that role as producer tell me about how that is because sonically you know how to really blend and put people together oh wow um i mean it's just as a producer you just have to know what ultimately you want it to sound like and so the hard part is 
conveying that to whoever the performer is. And I got to tell you, one of the easiest things to do is uh, first make that call to the particular vocalist or whoever it is that you already kind of know how they sing or perform before they're even in the studio. So it's like casting a movie, kind of. You, you need to know what do they do and almost, you know, kind of let them do what they do once they get in there. Because what, if you made that right call, they're going to do what they do and you already kind of sort of know what they, know what it is. Um, beyond that, you're just kind of refining, you know, little ins and outs, a little this and that. Hey, let's try that one more time. It's always trying to make them feel comfortable in the studio. Uh, once they start getting nervous in there, that's a bad, that's a wrap. Uh, so it's like, you know, positive, being really positive and um, just getting the best possible performance out of everybody. Growing up playing keyboard and playing classical and evolving into the musician you become, who were some of your musical piano influences or keyboard influences? Uh, definitely Chick Corea. Uh, when he started the electric band, oh my God, that was blowing my mind. Uh, I tried to kind of play along with all those tried <laughs> uh and then i i tried to recreate those tracks myself too trying to make the same sounds that chick was getting i mean that's virtually impossible but i was you know i was doing my best and uh that's how i learned how to start producing at a young age i try to recreate these albums that i was listening to um i was also way into jeff lorber fusion you know again that fusion stuff also the yellow jackets so russell ferrante a uh, big uh, piano influence on me. Um, you know, beyond that, I mean, I, of course, I listened to all the greats, you know, Oscar and Art and everybody I could sink my teeth into. Um, but I, I it, during that time, my formative years, I was definitely more into the fusion side of things. Um, even the Marcus Miller and then a lot of the David Sanborn records I was way into, you know. I was... Early I was, 80s, yeah, mid-80s. Yeah. yeah. Valley getaway. Tell me about this. It's coming up in June, and you have some very, very big names that are going to be headlining this year. Yeah, it's uh, it's grown into quite an event. This year, it's a five-day uh, festival um, with. I mean, we got everybody from Al Jarreau and Shaka Khan, Boney James, and like 20 other big names on on the uh, the lineup this year. It's so much fun. Uh, it's a whole lot of work, but the payoff is amazing because once the fans get there and see how much love and attention we put into all the little details 
throughout those five days, um, everyone just has a wonderful time. I mean, during the day, we're doing wine tastings, during intimate little concerts. We have big shows outside in the middle of the vineyards. We have a couple shows at uh, in a theater uh, up in the middle of the valley. I mean, and other uh, small other intimate things as well. And the after parties, which are crazy. Oh, man. I'm looking forward to those. Uh, so, yeah, it's, um, you know, this year is going to be our fourth year. So uh, it's an annual event. We're, we're definitely doing it for a long time. So you got to come out next year. Why did you start this? Because it's un I understand that Napa Valley has some dynamic vineyards, but it's also kind of the hybrid of both class as far as, or art, meaning that people who are into wine are into art, and yeah. I think this is a perfect mix. Well, they always say wine and jazz are an amazing mix, and I truly believe that. You know, people that are into jazz are, you know, they like more sophisticated things, and uh, you know, have lived life a little bit more, if you know what I mean. I mean, they, once you get into jazz, it's an appreciation, kind of like appreciating great wine. Um, so that's why I think they fit well together. And you put those two two together in one of the most beautiful settings on the planet in Napa Valley. I mean, it's uh, you can't go wrong there. If memory serves me correct, I understand that there's a Brian Culbertson. Uh, there's a oh, yeah. there's a wine. Yeah, I, I actually blended my own Pinot Noir. Wow. Uh, it's called Culbertson Pinot Noir. I'm also, also going to release a rosé this summer as well. Um, so we figured, hey, if it's going to be a summer festival, we got to have a rosé. Put that on ice. So, yeah, that's been a lot of fun, too, getting to know, you know, the wine business, too, and uh, more more and more knowledgeable. You know, I'm, I'm certainly no expert in wine, but I, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. You know, a few years I've been going up there and uh, really, really enjoy it.